morning, Mosaic Church. I want to invite everyone on their feet to worship God this morning. I'm so happy to have you all here.
worthy for his forgiveness maybe wasn't worthy for his love but in that moment when Jesus met her at that well and he said if you only knew if you only knew who was sitting in front of you if you only knew who was asking you for something to drink I don't know how many of you just needed Jesus just needed God to meet you right where you were right in the middle of your of your desert right in the middle of your storm right in the middle of your disaster right in the middle of your loneliness right in the middle of your sin right in the middle of your temptation and I'm here to tell you in this morning that Jesus is ready that he's here to meet you right where you are that even though you may not feel like you are enough in this morning you may say I'm not enough but I need you I need you to come Jesus won't you meet me me here again cause all All I want is you and your entirety, God. It's all you are. Will you meet me here again? Not for a minute. Who was I forsaken? The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, to rival. somebody that believes that in this morning I need you to declare that he's in this place I need you
you to invite the Holy Spirit in this place. Dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Can we declare that one more time? Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come Holy Spirit. Dry bones awaken. people in this place, God, and they've been trying to do it alone, and you're just saying, come visit the well. That's simple. Just come visit the well. Church, God is beckoning us to visit the well this morning, the water that doesn't run dry, that will quench every thirst that we have. Father, we lift up our hands to you this morning, and we say we're ready to receive with open hearts. Father, invite, we invite your Holy Spirit to do something in us, God, that we can never do by ourselves. Father, we ask that you would have your way. We lift up your good, holy, and faithful name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning, Mosaic Church. Isn't it wonderful to worship in the house of God together? Amen. Well, go ahead and smile at someone. Give them a wave as you take a seat. We are blessed to be able to gather together in the house of God this morning. You know, as the Easter is coming up, who knows Easter is right around the corner. Can you believe how early it is this year? We would just like to remind you that our 9 a.m. service is our kids' ministry service. So if you are inviting friends and family and loved ones in the next coming weeks, make sure if they have little ones, you invite them to the 9. We also offer a 1030 service. So again, thank you for inviting your friends and family. That's our best way of encouraging people into the love of God. Our ages, uh, we offer 0 to 2, 3 to 5, and 6 to 12. Tonight is our growth track. So if you are brand new to the church or you maybe you've been with us for a while but you have yet to come to our growth track, it's tonight from 6 to 8 p.m. in our growth track room with myself and we'll be sharing about the mission and the vision and the values here at Mosaic Church. At the end of the, that two-hour time together, you'll learn about different areas of our church and how you can get further plugged in. So if you are looking to get plugged into a life group or you're looking to get plugged in on the serve team or just hear more about us and a kind of our vision and our hopes and how you can partner with us, make sure you come tonight at six o'clock here at the church. Let us know you're coming on Facebook. We have an event. Just let us know you'll be there or stop by the second time booth on your way out and let us know. Speaking of life groups, can we just give a round of applause for our life groups and our life group leaders who have been preparing over the last three weeks with our life group coach on how they can best be a life group host to serve their groups well. In the spring, launching on March 14th, so mark the week of March 14th down, all of our life groups will be launched on that week. Some of them are our Fresh Start class. And our Fresh Start is if you've given your life to Christ, and maybe it's been a while or maybe you recently get, have given your life to Christ, this is the class for you because this is the time that you're going to go deeper and say, how do I walk this thing out? How do I live every day for the glory of the Lord? And so that's our Fresh Start group. We have a women's group being offered, a men's group, our young adult, which I always like to give a shout out to because I lead that, our 18 to 35 year old young adult life group it will be on Mondays uh, we have a purpose-driven life group coming up as well and we are so blessed and excited for that group so if you have a you know you there's a call of God on your life that God has given you a purpose and you're ready to go deeper in that and you want to walk that out and say Lord I don't want to just live for myself I don't want to live for the world I'm ready to go deeper we have a purpose-driven life group we have a marriage life group, so if you want to strengthen your marriage or say, God, how did you intend for marriage to serve you, and how can we do that better, you'll want to make sure you sign up for that. And we also have a financial peace life group, and that is such a blessing because that is a way to go into 2021 saying, God, I want to get my finances right this year. I don't want to live in uh, depression related to financial debt or stress. God, you called me to live free. How do I steward my finances well? How do I put you first in every area of my life? And so you're going to make sure you get plugged into that life group. So uh, next week, you'll be able to sign up for all of these. Make sure you write uh, March 14th down. You start uh, praying about which life group God is calling you to, and then you'll stop at the second time booth to be able to sign up for that. 
Uh, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, like we had mentioned, it's right around the corner in our Good Friday service as well. We need some volunteers for, to build up our serve team for those days. So if you feel, and we know God has called all of us and given us giftings and different talents, and you want to be able to serve on that day and make this atmosphere a place of God's love that everyone feels welcomed, uh, stop at the second time booth today and let us know that you are interested in being a part of the serve team on that day, on Easter and on Palm Sunday. Again, guys, we just thank everybody for wearing their masks and being respectful to all of us around each other. Um, at this time, guys, go ahead and grab your Connect cards. They're in the chair in front of you. Just slip that out. If you're a first-time guest, go ahead and select that, hang on to it, and visit our first-time booth. We just have a little something to say, hey, thanks. We're so blessed you decided to join our church family. If this is your second time to Mosaic Church, make sure you stop at the second-time booth. Again, we just have a little something to thank you of being a part of our church family, and we're excited to have you with us. Um, and if this is your, re your regular attendee, select that and just put it in your basket on the way out with your tithing envelope. Those are also in the chairs in front of you. Don't forget, guys, you can text to give online at 833-965-2024, and that'll be up in the chat. Um, and again, if you have any questions about anything I said, or you're like, Pastor Sarah, that was way too fast, go ahead and stop at the second time booth and we'll clarify anything that you have. Uh, today, guys, we have Pastor Steve Dufresne and uh, Pastor Liz with us this morning. We are so blessed by them. They pastored at Morning Star Fellowship in, in Bechtelsville for over 38 years, and they have been our parent-affiliated church and have just been huge supports to us as we've launched Mosaic Church, and they've been journeying beside us, and we feel beyond blessed to have them with us as we continue in the month of February on our series of just relationships and how God has designed us to function well in relationships and have, have freedom in our relationships relationships and be able to show his love. So in a moment, he's going to come up and just be able to share with you all. So could we just uh, give him a warm welcome from Mosaic Church to him? Well, good morning, everyone. Is everybody going, doing well? It's such an honor to be here with wonderful, your wonderful pastors, uh, Pastor Joseph and Kristen and Pastor Sarah and, uh, and the new addition to Mosaic Church, Emery, Jane. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, we just bless those guys. I'm sure they're checking in on us today. And so I, I am honored to be here. And today I wanted to take some time and talk about family relationships, family relationships. And so uh, if you want to turn a while, you can turn to Genesis chapter 25. That's where we'll spend most of our time in that area, Genesis chapter 25. And, uh, and so I'm honored today to come and to build on the uh, topic of relationship. Now, I come from a big family. I have five sisters and two brothers. Mom and dad, me, that makes ten. Ten of us. And, uh, and you know, uh, we had to be kind of messed up, right? That's a lot of people in one family, right? And so family issues are just, they're just common, family issues. And, and, and in fact, when I was on my 12th birthday, I came home from school as I saw the fire trucks leaving my house. Turns out my youngest sister was sticking a knife in the outlet, the outlet, and the sparks came down on her bed and started on fire. And, you know, the house was not totally destroyed, but pretty bad. And so I spent the next five months at my friend's house as we put our house back together. So for five months, I'm not even with my family. I'm at my friend's house, and I don't even know how that went, you know. But uh, so, so, you know, we had all kinds of family dynamics and issues going on today. And so in this room, there are all kinds of family dynamics that take place. And, and I decided to pick a kind of messed up family in the Bible. So we go back to the Bible and maybe feel good about our family as we look at this messed up family in the Bible. And let me introduce to you Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac and Rebekah, you know, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they're kind of the early families of the Bible. And Isaac and Rebekah. And, and actually, they're, they're kind of, their love story is kind of interesting how that all happened. So that was kind of nice. But they, uh, they have twin boys. Twin boys, Esau and Jacob. Now, now, my wife is an identical twin. If you met her sister, you would think, you know, man, they are, they, they're lookalikes, right? And, uh, and, and, and they talk every day. Sometimes they talk two, three times a day. But there was a time for several years they weren't talking together at all. I didn't know how to fix it. My brother-in-law didn't know how to fix it. But by the grace and mercy of God, they found a way to get healed and to fix it. And next week she'll be ministering on continuing relationships, and she'll talk about that as well. That's her story. But uh, so twin boys have been 
born to this family. And so let's read it together in Genesis chapter 25 and 20, starting with verse 21. We'll read through verse 23, all right? Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord answered his prayer. And his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So keep that in mind. The older will serve the younger. And you know that's never, never good in a family situation when the baby brother or sister becomes the boss of the family, right? So you know we're on, on, on the track here. So the first one comes out of the womb, and, and, and the Bible says that he is, he's reddish and he's hairy. And so he, he looked like he was covered in a blanket. And so his mom named him Esau, which means hairy. I was coming back from Florida several years ago, and I decided that I was going to start looking up my grandchildren's, and I have seven grandkids, and I was going to start looking up their name and what it means, and, and I won't go through all seven, but uh, Carter means, that's the first, he's the oldest, he's 13. Carter means that he's a cart driver, that he del delivers things in carts. And in fact, I said to him the other day, I said, Carter, you know what your name means? He said, yeah, cart driver. <laughs> we'll see how all that turns out, right? So I want to just take some time to talk about these two twins. Now, the second boy comes out, and his name is Jacob, which means heel. And in many ways, he is a heel. He's grabbing on to his brother's heel, but he becomes kind of like a deceiver, and we'll talk about that in the moment. So the boys grow up. Esau became an expert hunter, and uh, the Bible tells us that he was an outdoorsman type, you know, the kind of rough and ready guy. And, and he, and, and it, but Jacob preferred to be inside. He liked the indoors. He liked hanging out. And, and the Bible says that, is, that, is, that the father loved Esau and the mother loved Jacob. In fact, the Bible is very clear about this, that the, the, the mother loved more Jacob and the father loved more Esau. And that's not a good thing. You know, I mean, I've heard people say there's something special about your first child. No, they're all equal. They're all loved. They're all cared for. Now, I know there are different personalities in families, and so you're you're kind of attracted to the one that's like you. And you wish the whole world was like, like you. Many times I think, if the whole world was like me. But it doesn't work that way, right? There are different personalities. And so, so, so there's, there's conflict just because of the different personalities. And so they grow up, and, and, and now they're young adults, they're men. And one day Esau comes in from the field, and, uh, and Jacob has been busy uh, making homemade stew. And... Uh, Esau comes in, he says, listen, give me some of that stew. I am starving to death. And Jacob says, well, let's make a trade. Give me your rights as the firstborn. In the Bible, there were certain rights that went with the firstborn. He said, give me your rights as the firstborn, and I'll give you some of this stew. And Esau says, what's the use of the birthright if I'm going to die? He wasn't really going to die, but that's, so he said, all right, it's a deal. So he traded, he shrugged off. His, his, uh, his giftings as the firstborn just for a bowl of stew. When Esau is now 40 years old, he marries two Canaanite women. That's how it was like in the Old Testament. That's never a good thing, right? And he, he marries two really ungodly women, and they become like a thorn in the side of his mother and father. And, and they fight against the faith of the family. And he kind of does it just to Torque them, you know? He's not making great choices, Esau. And when Isaac becomes an old man, the Bible says he is almost blind. And so he says to Esau, he says, uh, go out, get your bow and your arrow, go out, get some honey, get, get some game for me, prepare it the way I like it, because I'm going to eat this meal, I'm getting ready to die, and I want to bless you before I die. Rebecca is eavesdropping, and she's like, there's no way he's going to pass over Jacob. And so she says to Jacob, go get a couple of goats in the backyard. I'm going to prepare them for your father. You're going to go in. You're going to serve him the meal, and you're going to get the blessing instead of your brother. And he says, wait a minute. He's hairy. I'm smooth. He says, if my father asked me to come close, 
He's going to touch me. Instead of blessing me, he's going to curse me. And she says, don't worry about it. And so she's going to teach him how to become a deceiver. So she prepares the meals. While she's preparing the meals, she's going to get some dress-up clothes for him, Esau's clothing, and she's going to get some goat skin, and she's going to put them on his hand here and on the, on the back of his neck. And, 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 he, and, he, and he goes in. The meal is ready. He goes into his father, and he says to his father, Father, I'm here. Sit up and eat your meal. And, 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 Jake, and Isaac says, which son are you? He recognizes something different in the voice. He says, I'm your firstborn son Esau. Come, sit up, eat the game that I prepared, and put a blessing on me. And Isaac said, well, how did you get the food so fast? And he said, God looked favorably on me and clearly led me to this game. Isaac said, come closer so I can touch you. And he comes closer and he touches. And he says, it's the voice of Jacob, but you feel like Esau. And he eats the meal. After he eats the meal, he says, are you sure you're Esau? He says, come closer. And as he reaches in to give his father a hug, his father smells the clothing. And he says, the smell is the smell of Esau. And here's the blessing that he gives to him. He says, may God give you the dew of heaven and earth bounty of grain and wine. May people serve you and, and, and nations honor you. You will master your brothers and your mother's sons. They will honor you. Those who curse you will be cursed, and those who bless you will be blessed. Just a little side note. Wouldn't it be awesome when your little babies become teenagers, and some way down the road you put your hands on them and you pronounce a blessing on them? I'm telling you, our kids are hungry for a father's blessing. That's just a side note, all right? That's a powerful moment in life. Jacob leaves, and Esau comes in, and he says, hey, Father, I'm here. He says, get up and eat some of the gain and give me your personal blessing. And Isaac said, who are you? He said, I'm your firstborn son, Esau. And Isaac starts trembling like he's having a seizure. I just finished, he said, a meal, and I blessed him, and he is blessed forever. And when Esau heard those words, he, he began to sob violently, and bitterly, he cried to his father, can't you bless me too? And Esau said, I can't believe that that deceiver, talking about his brother, has deceived me too. And the father tries to console his son who's now sobbing uncontrollably. And then he blesses him and he says this, you live far from the earth's bounty, remote from heaven's dew. You live by your sword, hand to mouth, and you will serve your brother. But when you can't take it, and remember these words here, we'll talk about it later. And when you can't take it anymore, you'll break loose and run free. Those are powerful words. When you can't take it anymore, you will break loose and run free. Genesis 25, 23 says, one people will be stronger than the other, and the younger will be served by the older. So it's come to pass, right? God's not surprised the twists and turns that take place in a family. He's not surprised at all. God knows. He knows it all. But I, what I want you to remember are the words, but when you can't take it anymore, you will break loose and run free. So Esau now sees in anger. And he says to himself, the time of mourning my father will quickly come to pass. And when that is over, I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. And when Rebecca understands what's about to happen, she goes to her husband Isaac and she says, send Jacob away. She doesn't say I'm, a fear I'm fearful for his life. She says, send him away to my uncle, 500 miles away, where he can find a woman who has our same kind of faith. Because if he marries another ungodly woman, I can't stand it and I want to die. So she sends him away to, to, uh, to her brothers. He goes to his uncle Laban's house. And, uh, and that's where our, our, our story begins to unfold. And here, here's the thing you need to recognize. This messed up family, and that's the first thing I want to talk about, the messed up family, is messed up by their own choices. By their own choices, they become messed up. And many of the times in our lives, if we're honest, it's 
not wanting to give in, not wanting to bend, we have created some mess in our lives. So be encouraged today that you're not the only messed up family in this world. We're all messed up. We all have issues, and we're all working on those things. The first thing I want you to notice about this messed up family and why it's messed up is because of entitlement. If you're taking notes, write the word entitlement down. And let me just give you a quick entitlement quiz. When I give you this quiz, I want you to, when you hear the statement, either rank it a one through a five, one that you totally disagree with the statement, or five, you totally agree with the statement. Here we go. I deserve respect from others. I demand good service at a restaurant. And maybe you sat with some people at a restaurant who are pretty demanding, right? My closest friends owe me loyalty. People should treat me the way I treat them. When I do something nice for someone, I expect them to do something nice for me. And then one more. When I open the door for someone, I expect them to say, say it, thank you. And you know, that doesn't always happen, right? But what I want you to notice is we all wrestle with entitlement. I mean, we're always talking about the young generation. There are they're just entitlement and all those guys. But we all wrestle with entitlement. We had two teenage boys. And, uh, and when they grew up and they were old enough to drive, we made them pay for their own car insurance because we wanted them to realize that privileges come with a cost. And I remember when my oldest son went off to college, he calls me one day and he says, Dad, you're not going to believe it. He went to Texas, right? He said, these kids down here, they've got the nicest pickup trucks. Their parents buy them cars and they pay for their car insurance. To which I said to him, I'm sorry you were born into the wrong family. Entitlement, right? He expected me to say, hey, listen, don't worry about your car insurance. I'll take care of it from now on. But you were born into the wrong family. So we all wrestle with this entitlement thing, and, and this whole entitlement thing has messed up this family because Esau is kind of saying this. It doesn't matter about the choices I've made. I'm still the firstborn, and I deserve all the rights of being the firstborn. And, and his dad is saying, hey, I am the patriarch in his house, and this is my call. It's my right. I should be able to do what I want to do. But he obviously forgot that he wasn't the firstborn in his family because Ishmael was, but Isaac got the blessing from his father, secondborn, right? That's another story, a messed up family, right? And, uh, and obviously, Rebecca is thinking, well, I can't wait on God. You know, God, you know, if it's if what he said to me that the older is going to be is serve the younger, then I just can't sit here and wait for God to take care of all this thing. I've got to kind of get in there and make sure this thing happens and force the hand of God. See, the whole family is wrestling with entitlement. And Jacob is saying, hey, it was Esau's choice. I mean, he could have gave him the stew for free, right? But he made the bargain because he felt like, i got to make sure that I'm entitled to the blessing too. Entitlement. The second thing is, second word is deception. Rebecca is a deceptive mother who teaches her son how to deceive. And she deceives her husband, Isaac. And someone made the statement, what you hide divides. You start hiding things. From your, from your family members, from your husbands and wives or whatever, you start hiding things, you're going to bring division into the family. And Rebecca taught Jacob how to be a deceiver, how to work things your way to get your way in the situation. He became a trickster. He tricked his father, and he tricked his brother Esau. But in the end, deceiver now moves to his uncle Laban's house, is going to spend the next 20 years being deceived by his uncle. And remember how that starts out, right? He, he gets to his uncle's house, and he sees Rebecca, and he's, he makes a deal with his uncle. I'm going to work for, he said, I'm going to work for seven years for Rebecca. And it's like seven years went like overnight because he was so in love. And on that wedding, he was deceived because he woke up the next morning, right? It was dark, and he woke up the next morning, and there was Leah, the sister, laying next to him. She was the oldest sister. And the dad says, there's no way I'm going to let my older daughter not or get married, whatever, before my younger. I just got lost my train of thought there. 
So anyway, he, he, now, he has, now he's married to Leah. And, and he works for seven more years. He says, I'll work seven more years for Rebecca. But he spends 20 years working for his uncle, being deceived by his boss. And the Bible says 10 times he changed his pay scale. You can check all that out in the Bible. So he's spending all this time getting a good dose of his own medicine. Because the Bible says to us what? You reap what you sow. And let me encourage you, as a, if you're a new believer, I know you're saying, man, I am still reaping some of the past. But you're sowing good seeds now. And hang on, because a good harvest is coming, all right? But he's, he's weeping now. And, and, then, and then the animosity. We talked about how Esau, he is bitter. Have you ever been bitter? Have you ever let the root of bitterness grow inside of you where you are filled with rage and you just can't wait? You dream day and night about the moment that you can get revenge against your brother. And the Bible says it's that Esau seized with anger. So how do you think things are going in Esau's life? How do you think the situation is going in that household where he can't probably stand his mom for what she's done? And how about the husband and wife? How, how does Rebecca and Isaac, after all the deception, because what you hide divides. It is a broken and divided family. But the good news is healing is coming to this family. Aren't you glad I said the good news to last? Because you're like, oh, my heavens, my family's not as bad as this. Number two, the restored family. Some, something powerful happens, and this family is transformed right before our eyes in the Scripture pages. And the first thing that transformed this, this family is gratitude. Write it down, gratitude. And, and uh, Jacob says to God, he's having a conversation with God, and he's having this moment of pure thanksgiving and gratitude. And he says this in Genesis 32.10, I'm not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you've shown to me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except a walking stick. Now my household is filled with two large camps. See, despite the dysfunction in a family, God is still working in everyone's life in that family. In the midst of all the mess and all the brokenness, God is still at work in this family. And the gratitude that fills Jacob's heart is the start of the healing process. When was the last time, and I read this a few weeks ago, and I've been trying to do this every single day, wake up every day and start the day off thankful for three things. You can find three things every day that you're grateful for. I mean, most of us in this room, we're healthy. You know, either we've gone through or we haven't gotten COVID and we're healthy, we're strong. God has blessed us so we can quickly find things that we're grateful for and gratitude will change us. I don't know if you've ever listened to the Dave Ramsey show and I noticed you're going to do financial peace and I, I encourage all of you to get in on that because it'll change your life. And, 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 and when people call into the Dave Ramsey show, they usually say, hey, Dave, how are you doing? And what does Dave usually say? Better than I deserve. So I'm going to say, hey, Mosaic, how you doing? You're going to say, better than I deserve. All right, you ready? Hey, Mosaic Church, how you doing? Better than I deserve. Better than I deserve. See, there's something powerful about gratitude. And Jacob's having this moment, God, you've been so good to me in the midst of all of my bad choices. And you've, you've blessed my life because, because the thing that will fight and kill entitlement is gratitude. Better than I deserve. I don't deserve any of the good stuff that's in my life. And I don't care how many years you've walked with Jesus Christ. You still recognize the amazing grace of God. And I don't deserve, I don't even deserve to stand up here today and proclaim your word. But by the grace of Jesus Christ and your amazing saving power and the power of your Holy Spirit. And we sang about that today. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. And I'm doing better than I deserve. Gratitude is kills the spirit of entitlement. So after gratitude comes a heart change. You become grateful, then all of a sudden God's working on your heart, and it's time for Jacob's heart to turn toward home. 20 years, and all of a sudden God awakens him and says, I want you to turn your heart toward home. 
And here's what the Bible says, and God is speaking to Jacob. He says, I'm the God who appeared to you at Bethel, the place where you, where you anointed the pillar of stone and made your vow to me. Now get ready and leave this country and return to the land of your birth. God is saying to him, it's time to turn your face, your face, your face toward home. It's time to move forward and go back home. It's time to find the healing and the restoration you need at home. And my prayer today is that everyone sitting in this room or watching online, all of a sudden God will capture your heart and say it's time to turn toward home. And then humility. It's a powerful word. Humility. Write it down. Someone has to make the first move. Someone always has to make the first move. So here's what I'm going to ask you today. Why not you? Why not you? Someone has to make the first move. You know in a tug of war, right? The tug of war is over when someone drops the rope. That's it. You drop the rope, it's over. Someone wins, someone loses, but it doesn't matter at that moment. It matters is that you are moving forward in your life. Then Jacob went on ahead and he, he, he goes toward home. And as he approaches his brother, now there's a lot of time that goes on between this because now he's traveling, he's traveling with kids, he's traveling with livestock, and so it takes days, it takes weeks. And now all of a sudden, he, he approaches and he sees his brother coming the other direction. And he's coming with, the Bible says, 400 men. And, you know, he's, he's fearful, he's nervous. I mean, my brother last, I heard he wants to kill me, and, and here he's coming. And, and the Bible says that Jacob bows to the ground seven times before his brother. And listen to what he says when he gets to his brother, because it'll be the key for you. Jacob said, please, if you can find it in your heart, welcome me and accept these gifts. Basically said, because some of you are saying, what do I say when I go back home? What do I say when I stand before them? You say these words, if you can please find it in your heart, please forgive me. That's it. If you can find it in your heart, Please forgive me. So let's practice that right now. Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? And then the last word, forgiveness. Forgiveness. I love the sound of that word, forgiveness. I love receiving when I don't deserve it, forgiveness. Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? Let me show you what forgiveness looks like, all right? Genesis 33, verse 4. When Esau, he said, so he approaches his brother, can you find it in your heart to forgive me? And here it is. Then Esau ran to meet him, to meet Jacob. And he embraced him. He threw his arm around his neck and kissed him. And they both wept together. Isn't that a powerful moment? He thinks his brother is going to get revenge. And he says, can you please find it in your heart to forgive me? Obviously, God was working in Esau's heart a long time, too. And that was his intention. They see each other, they run to each other, they embrace each other, and they weep in each other's arms. Remember the part of the story I told you to remember till we got to it? And here it is. But when you can't take it anymore, you'll break loose and run free. The word spoken over Jacob by his father, his father Isaac, right? When you can't take it anymore, you're going to break loose and run free. See, here's what I want to say to you. When you can't take the resentment anymore, when you can't stand the animosity that's burning inside of you, the constant knots that are inside of you, the bitter thoughts that control your mind, when you can't take it anymore, you'll break loose and run free. You'll break loose and run free. Esau says to Jacob, he says, let's go home. Let's go home. Jacob tells him, you go ahead ahead of me because I can't push the little children that fast. And Esau says to him, well, I'm going to leave some of my men behind to protect you along the way. And Jacob says, he says, it's not necessary. There's no need. Your generous welcome is all I wanted. He felt safe and secure didn't worry about anything else because your, your generous welcome is all that I wanted. There is nothing as sweet as restoration. There's nothing as powerful 
as restoration. Just a little side note. The Bible doesn't indicate this, that Rebecca was alive at all to see this happen. In fact, every indication is that she was gone at this time. But Isaac, who says, I'm about to die, is still living. Isn't that amazing? 20-some years. Now the guy's 180 years old. But he got to see his sons restored. And the Bible says this, that when he finally did die, he was buried by Jacob and Esau. There's nothing in those moments when you're saying your final goodbyes. You know, the last thing I want in life is to see my family so ticked off at me that they wouldn't come to say me, see me off. And Isaac got to see that as his sons together saw him pass off into the next life. So here's my word to you today. Don't let it take 20 years. Please don't let it take 20 years. And somebody's got to take their first step. And I know inside of you, you're like, I don't know how this is going to turn out. But take the chance. Take the chance and see what God will do if you just turn your heart toward home. Just before the worship team leads us in a final song, I want to take a moment because I want to make sure that anyone watching online or in this room, if you've never given Jesus Christ your life, I mean, he's standing with open arms. There's nothing as sweet as being restored into a right relationship with God. I can tell you, on my worst day, I won't want to live any other way. Living for God, living for Jesus, being in right standing with him because of his grace and his mercy is powerful. And right now in this moment, all you have to do is simply say, say to God, God, I am ready. Please receive me as your son or your daughter. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you, Lord, for those that are in this room that maybe need to respond to you. And today, let them just feel your embrace as they come to you and simply say, Jesus, here I am. I know I don't deserve your salvation. I know all the things that I've done and how far I've run away from you, but today I'm turning my heart toward home and I'm turning my heart toward you. Please receive me, forgive me, and step into my life. Father, I especially pray for those that are, have some difficult family situations that are going on. Father God, if you did it once, you can do it again. And if you did it for... Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Esau, you can do it again. So let your amazing grace watch o- wash over us and God help us to step in to restoration and healing. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm not enough unless you come will you meet
of the Lord this week. Amen. We are so grateful. We are so grateful, church. You know, as we're taking this time just to reflect on the goodness of God, I just pray as everyone would walk out of this place that it would be with a restored spirit, with new vision for their family, for new vision of how God can restore and enable things that we thought were long gone or so far off that we never thought it could be back into restoration. We serve a God of hope, and I'm so excited for us this week and what God is going to do in our lives this year, starting with us, right? 
starting with us and then in our families and in our communities and our neighborhoods and beyond. So we are so grateful to have this wonderful couple with us. And um, right before we close, we're just going to ask uh, Pastor Liz just has an opportunity that she just wants to make known to all of us as we leave. So uh, just again, thank you all for coming today. And we'll just close with a, with a short opportunity for you all. Great to be here today. And I wanted to let you know we were able to bring up at least 20 boxes of food with us from a food drive that the University of Valley Forge does. So in that box are some chicken legs, I believe, cooked chicken legs some hot dogs, some cheese, some cottage cheese, some milk, some potatoes and apples, I think. So it's all yours for the taking. It's out in Steve's car. He's going to open up our trunk. And um, if you need something or you know somebody that needs food today, we'd love for you to drop it off, okay? We appreciate the opportunity to be here. I look forward to coming back next week and speaking. So just make sure you stop by on your way out. We look forward to having you all back next week. Have a blessed week, everyone.